Hey guys, this is Dan, uh, better known as Spiffy. Um, perhaps you've noticed I haven't been posting as many videos lately. Um, there was a month there where I didn't post any at all, and uh, most of what I've posted since I've been back has been uh, from church. So, today we're going to talk about why that is. Um, I am a COVID-19 coronavirus survivor. Um, I had it, and I have since recovered, and I'm going to tell you my story. Um, so, uh, earlier this year, first of all, you guys know if you watch my videos that um, I've done a lot of business with China. I have bought uh, LED lighting from them direct. I've bought glasses from them direct. I've worked with fan companies there. I've worked with LED companies there. Um, and so when it first hit China, I was aware of it, which was before a lot of people in the U.S. were aware of it. I, you know, early as January, I knew about uh, the new coronavirus, which is COVID-19, uh, because it uh, started in late 2019. Um, and I'd known that it had wiped out huge populations in China. And so I figured if it came to the U.S., uh, it would be pretty terrible. So I was already kind of on the lookout for something like that happening before it was really in U.S. news. Um, and then early in, in January and February, I got sick. And uh, the symptoms weren't the same, but I went into the doctor anyways and said, hey, I've heard about this uh, new coronavirus thing happening, and uh, I do a lot of business with China. It's possible that I have it. And uh, they checked me out, and it turns out that I had a... Uh, bad sinus infection. So I was out of commission for a good part of the beginning of the year with that. And I recovered by uh, sometime in March. By this time now the coronavirus has been pretty serious. It's come to the U.S. Uh, our government's handled it pretty poorly and so it's spread everywhere. And um, you know, by now we're starting to take precautions but we're still learning about it. And uh, at the end of uh, March, I got sick again. So, uh, I'll just preface this, um, that I am relatively young, I'm under 40, um, and I had no pre-existing conditions. Uh, I had low blood pressure, low blood sugar, low cholesterol, uh, no asthma or anything like that. Uh, I had no health problems whatsoever. Um, and uh, by this time, by the end of March, uh, I don't think we'd started shutting down states yet. Things weren't closed, but uh, we were already doing social distancing. Um, we'd already talked about the six feet. I don't think people were wearing masks yet. Um, everybody was carrying hand sanitizer. Um, my church had gone down to streaming only services. So it was just me and uh, the necessary people there and then everybody was watching on the internet. And actually, if you go and you find the last videos that I posted in March, uh, with the last one of which was the hymn challenge, um, those were all from the very, very last service before I was hospitalized. Uh, and they were streaming only. So, um, end of March. And that Sunday, if you go back and look at my videos, I posted the videos from our first streaming only service. And then the hymn challenge, which I did afterwards with Janetti and Cornell. And uh, you should know them if you watch my music videos. Janetti's my partner in crime, the little, uh, little short, dark-skinned woman. And then Cornell is the uh, bigger guy with the beard. Um, and uh, uh, that Sunday, after I left church, I felt really tired and really sick. I didn't feel like I had specific symptoms yet. So I just was like, okay, I'm wore out. And I went home, and I went to bed, and I went to sleep. Uh, and, you know, sometimes on Sundays I'll try to get my videos up, or I'll try to do garbage, or do other things. I say do garbage, sorry, you guys don't live with me, you don't know what I mean. Take the garbage out, because our garbage collection is on Monday. So I'll, you know, go through the house and empty all the garbage cans, and take them and put them in the big bin outside. Anyhow, I'll normally do that when I get home on Sundays after church. But this Sunday, uh, I just went home and got straight in the bed, and I went to sleep, and I woke up um, Monday, it was Monday, March 23rd, 
And that Monday morning, I felt different than I'd ever felt before. I had a different set of symptoms. For starters, I had a fever, which I hadn't had yet this year. I was having a little bit of trouble breathing, and I was having a, a dry cough. With the sinus infection, you know, my nose was clogged, and I had a wet cough. Um, and at the time, those were the three most popular symptoms of COVID. We knew less about it then than we know now, but those are the things people are like, watch out for this, because if you have this, you might have it. Um, so I sent my doctor a message because uh, they weren't taking appointments anymore. And I said, hey, I've got these new symptoms now. Um, I think this time I might actually have it. And they said, yeah, it sounds like you do. Um, rest, drink lots of fluids, take Tylenol, and self-quarantine for 14 days. Um, and I, just to be safe, I called the, uh, I think the hospital's COVID hotline, pre-screening hotline to see who needs to come into the emergency room and who doesn't. And uh, they said the same thing. So I took Tylenol and I went back to bed that Monday. And when I got up that Tuesday, I had a new symptom uh, that I had never had before and I wasn't familiar with as a symptom of COVID or coronavirus, which was um, what they would call stomach distress. But I was having anything I ate was coming back out one end or the other, which is normal for the flu. But the thing that was new was anything I drank, including water, um, was was coming back out. When I, if I drank water, it came right back out of me. And that's I've been sick before. Um, when I was on tour in Europe, I had a real bad flu. Um, I've had a few other times when I've been really sick with colds and flus and sinus infections and other infections and stuff like that. I'd never had that happen before, and that worried me. Um, so I figured, okay, maybe for some reason my body just can't handle the medication right now. I was still taking the leftover medication from my sinus infection. I was still taking the Tylenol. I was taking Theraflu and stuff like that. I said, okay, you know what? Let's just drink water for the rest of this day and see if then my body can keep the water in. And, uh, it couldn't. So I had that whole Tuesday. I stopped taking the medicines and my body still was rejecting anything I put in it, including water. So the next morning, Wednesday, I called the doctor again. I called the, you know, the emergency room hotline again and said, hey, I still have the COVID symptoms, but I can't keep food or water down. And uh, they said, well, keep trying to keep fluids in you and stay home and quarantine and take Tylenol when you can and you should get through it. And um, Wednesday night, this is Wednesday the 25th, um, I'm trying to make it to the bathroom because I've been laying in bed, but obviously if I drink water and it comes out of me, I have to go to the bathroom. And if you've seen the tours of my house, there's video tours of my house. The bedroom and the bathroom are right next door on the same floor. It's not far. And I couldn't make it to the bathroom without collapsing. And um, I collapsed and TMI, there was just stuff coming out of me on all ends because I couldn't keep the fluids in me. They were coming out and I was just kind of collapsed on the floor and... Uh, in a big mess and um, I told my wife or she found me actually and um, she said uh, you need to go to the hospital and I said well I've already called twice and they told me that they wouldn't take me I should just stay home and she said well I'm calling in the morning so Thursday morning this was March 26th um, my wife called the hospital and uh, talked to I don't know if it was the same people or different people than I talked to but they said bring him in and uh, by this point, I couldn't walk, so I don't even know how I got from my bedroom, which is on the third floor, down to my car. My wife helped me, and somehow I made it. And she took me to the emergency room, and they came out with a wheelchair and got me out of the car. And uh, I was in the ER. This was Thursday, March 26th. And they gave me an IV of fluids, which helped, helped me feel better. They gave me the COVID test, where they take a cotton swab, stick it up your nose until it, you know, almost touches your brain, basically, and... They get the mucus from the back of your sinuses and test that for, they test it for coronavirus, flu, and everything else. And um, I tested negative for the flu, but positive for the coronavirus, the COVID-19. And uh, by the way, just, I'm using them interchangeably, but just so you know, coronavirus and COVID-19 are not the same thing. COVID-19 is a type of coronavirus. There are lots of different types of coronaviruses. Uh, they've been around for years. That's why you see different medications and different cleaners and things that came out before this saying they can treat coronavirus. That's because there's different types. The new type, the type that's killing people right now is, is COVID-19, which is a specific strain that's new as of 2019. Um, 
Anyhow, so, um, in the emergency room, they tested me for it, and, you know, the emergency room doctor, and God bless him, he said, you know, I know that I'm supposed to send you home because you should be able to get over this at home. You're young and healthy, and there's nothing else wrong with you. Um, but as bad off as you are right now, I think if I send you home, you'll be back here tonight. Um, but I can't keep you here. I can't keep you in the emergency room. Uh, so I'm going to call around until I can find a hospital that will take you. Um, so it took him, I made a note of uh, four hours, um, to find a hospital. And I asked the nurse after, you know, after, I don't know how many hours it was after three hours. And I said, what's taking so long? I'm just lying here. And they said, look, we can't find anybody that'll take you. We, first of all, none of these hospitals want coronavirus patients. But second of all, um, nobody wants you. You're young and healthy. They think it's a waste of a bed. Um, you know, uh, but, but we think you need to be admitted, so we're going to keep trying. And eventually they uh, convinced one of the doctors at Meritor, which is um, one of the best hospitals in my area. Actually, probably the best hospital in the greater Madison area. Um, they convinced one of the doctors at Meritor to admit me. Um, so I get to ride an ambulance uh, from the emergency room, which was way out. We went, so, aside, a tangent, um, I had my wife call and take me to an emergency room that was way out on the outskirts of town because I didn't, I was too sick to wait for hours. If you know, sometimes if you go to an emergency room, sometimes you have to wait for hours and hours in the waiting area until they admit you. I was too sick for that. I couldn't, I couldn't sit in a chair in a bright room for, you know, that long. So I suggested that we go to um, an emergency room that was way out on the outskirts of town. Um, and it worked out. There was no waiting. There were no other patients there. Um, so that was part of what helped. But then, of course, I had a you know long 45-minute ambulance ride from the emergency room to Meritor, which is downtown. And um, they admit me to Meritor, and they get me settled um, in a hospital bed. And uh, a doctor comes in the room, and he says, Hey, uh, I don't know why we have you here. You don't need to be here. I'm going to get you out of here by tonight. And I'm, th you know, I didn't, I didn't say anything specifically to him, but I'm thinking to myself, I can't go home if I can't keep water in my body. You can't live without water. And I can't go home if I can't walk from my bed to the bathroom. Like, that's, I can't survive at home. So I'm like, if by some miracle he can get me well enough to do those things by tonight, I'll happily go home tonight, but I don't want to go home until I can survive at home. Um, so that's the, that particular doctor, I only see him once again, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring him up you know, when I see him again, or I don't even know specifically when I do. Um, but but you know, before they try to get me out of there, and it, it's really hard for me to remember how the time elapsed. I think it was just later that day, but it could have been longer than that because everything kind of run ran together after a while. Um, I'm laying in, in my hospital bed, and I'm still on a regular floor. I'm in a regular room. I'm not in a, a special room or the ICU or anything like that. Uh, out of nowhere, like 30 people run into the room. They've got the crash carts. They've got the things where they do like this to your chest. They've got all kinds of machines, and they're running in, and they're, they're like panicked. They're just storming the room, and I don't know what's happening. I'm like, do you guys have the right room? You did you get lost and make a wrong turn, or you need a place to have a meeting, or do you need did you need somewhere to store this equipment? And they are like, oh my god, he's talking. What's going on? So apparently, what had happened is my heart rate, which is you know, boom. boom your heart rate, um, which normally for me would be anywhere between 80 and 100, uh, had jumped up to like 250. Um, and I wasn't supposed to be conscious. That's about, you know, they thought that that would, you know, they would have to revive me. Um, but uh, well, apparently it jumped up to like 250 for like seven minutes and then back to normal, then back up to 250 for another few minutes and then back to normal. Um, and they were so shocked that I was still conscious that they checked all the equipment to make sure that it wasn't an equipment failure. And they're like, no, this, all the equipment is good. This, his heart is doing this. And so one of the things that they were learning about COVID at the time, and I think is pretty a known symptom now, 
is it can affect your heart. Um, it can damage and cause changes and things to your heart. Um, and uh, that's what was happening, essentially. So um, it's called, uh, when your heart rate jumps like that, it's called tachycardia. I might be saying that wrong. Um, but that's a lesser known symptom of COVID-19. So they kept me hooked up to all the fancy heart monitors and stuff like that. And they moved me into the uh, heart and lung floor. They had a name for it. It's, ba it's thoracic and vascular, maybe, I don't know. But it's, it's basically, they called it to me. They said, we're not taking you to the ICU. We're taking you one step below the ICU. This is a more urgent floor than a regular room, but it's not the ICU. So I, always, I just call it the almost ICU for the rest of my hospital stay. Um, so they moved me up there, and they're measuring my heart, they're measuring my lungs, they're, you know, measuring my blood pressure, and they're, they're, you know, they got me hooked up to all the machines to measure everything, and, um, so far, everything is fine. Uh, so far, my oxygen levels are still fine. Um, but, uh, once I get moved into the almost ICU, my oxygen levels start dropping. And, um, you know, your, your oxygen levels are supposed to be between 90 and 100. And I assume that's percent. I honestly don't know. I could look it up. Um, and, uh, but that's where, that's where they're supposed to be. 100 is perfect. 90 is, you know, good enough. Um, but they were gradually dropping. And eventually, uh, anything below 90, uh, you need help. You need oxygen or you need something with your lungs or you need a machine, something. Um... So they started out at normal, and eventually they got below 40. And so as the day progresses, or days progress, again, I'm not totally clear on the time. Um, they First they give me an, like little oxygen things that goes in your nose. And when that's not enough to keep me breathing, then they give me a mask that goes over my nose and my mouth. And when that's not enough to keep me breathing, they give me a bigger mask with like a big oxygen bag that hangs in front of uh, my mouth. And there's a picture of that on social media, by the way, if you want to see it. Um, I can't remember where it is exactly, but you can find it. Um, I think it's on my Instagram. Um, but, uh, and that's not enough. And they, tell, they start telling me um, that uh, we think we're going to have to put you on a ventilator. Now, if you've been watching the news, everybody's been talking about ventilators. And are they, are they you know... Are people dying on them? Are they causing deaths? Are they helping people? Do we have enough of them? Do we not have enough? Um, are, uh, are there alternatives? Do people have to be? Um, you know, there's, it's, it's been a huge thing, especially now, but even then, because again, I've, keep in mind, I've been following the coronavirus, the COVID-19 coronavirus, since before it reached the U.S. So I, I have been following the news, and I've been hearing about the issues of ventilators and things like that. And what's been reported at this point is that under the best circumstances, if you get on a ventilator, you have about a 50% chance of surviving. And if you're in a place like New York where the hospitals are overwhelmed and they don't have enough beds and they don't have enough doctors and things are getting overlooked because they're just swamped, you have about a 10% chance of surviving. Now, I'm not saying those figures are correct. I'm just saying at the time, that's what I had read and heard on the news. And um, I'm sure they've changed since then. Um, but I asked my doctors, you know, because keep in mind, I'm, I'm in the hospital. By the way, at some point during this process, the doctor that said you shouldn't be here came back and said, hey, aren't you glad we admitted you? And I'm like, yeah, asshole, yeah. Um, I didn't say that, but that's, that was my thought. Um, but that's the only time I ever saw him again. Um, but uh, I asked, you know, so they, they rotate the doctors out. So I, I have the same doctor for anywhere from like one to three days, and then they switch. And it depends what floor I'm on and how serious I am. And at one point, they had to bring in coronavirus experts. Um, but whatever, whoever my doctor is on the rotation at the time, I ask them. I say, I've been following this in the news. You know, I, I know not to trust everything that's in the news, especially when it comes to medicine, but what I've been reading from the best sources that I have is that my best chances, if you put me on a ventilator, are 50%. That there's a 50% chance I'm going to die if I go on the ventilator. Am I wrong? And the doctor said, no, you're not wrong, but if you don't go on the ventilator, 
there's a 100% chance you're going to die. So I suggest you do it. I said, well, I've got this big old mask on. I'm alive right now. Why can't we just keep it like this, you know? And uh, so they go and they call my wife. And they're like, he's refusing the ventilator. He's going to die. And my wife calls my cousin, who's a doctor, who is uh, somebody that I trust greatly. Not that I didn't trust the doctors at the hospital, but, I mean, she's my cousin. I've known her my whole life. And she's not somebody that normally takes strong stances. Uh, and she called me and she said, look, they're right. Uh, you need to, I think she called them and talked to them first. And then she called me and said, look, they're right. Um, if you don't do this, you're going to die, so do it. And I said, okay. And I told the doctors, uh, go ahead. And um, so to be on a ventilator, they have to basically put you in a coma. You're not awake for the ventilator. And so I don't remember what happened after my... Well, honestly, the last thing I remember is talking to my cousin. And uh, I don't even remember telling the doctors, okay. Um, but obviously I did. And they put me into a, you know, what they a medically induced coma. And for, for the ventilator, they put a tube down your throat and into your lungs. They put another tube in your, in your parts uh, and another one in your butt. And... Um, and then obviously they have tubes in your arms for IVs and fluids and everything else. So I'm just a mess of tubes at this point. And I'm on this machine that's breathing for me. And I'm unconscious. And um, I'm hallucinating. Um, because they're giving me very strong narcotics. Two of the drugs they gave me to knock me out were uh, fentanyl, which is the drug that killed Prince. And propofol, which is the drug that killed Michael Jackson. Um, and they're very strong. As you know, they can... Uh, and the fact that both of those uh, famous musicians died from them. Um, and I have some crazy hallucinations uh, while I'm on there, which I'm not going to talk about publicly. But those of you that know me well, um, I'll discuss them privately. Um, and uh, I actually, at one point in time, I pulled my tube out, my breathing tube out. And I, uh, I don't know why. I don't know what I was thinking. I, I did it on purpose, but I didn't think I was pulling my breathing tube out. I don't know what I thought I was doing. Um... But I was supposed to be on the ventilator for 14 days, and sometimes people are on it for longer. Um, I was only on it, ended up only being on it for 10 days. They, um, they felt that I was strong enough to come off of it after 10 days, which was a very good sign. And uh, so I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but when my oxygen started to drop, they moved me into the ICU. I think I forgot to mention that. So I, I, started, in a regu I started in the emergency room, got moved to a regular room in a regular hospital, got moved to the almost ICU, got moved to the ICU while I was still conscious, uh, but while I was losing the ability to breathe. And um, then I was in the ICU while I was on the ventilator. And then, so I woke up in the ICU. And um, I woke up and all the tubes are still in me. And uh, I couldn't talk because there's a tube in my throat. And I could, I could see, but I couldn't see. Everything was blurry and out of focus and stuff because my, my brain's coming back, my eyes are coming back, everything's coming back. Um, and uh, that was the moment when I realized I was going to live because, um, again, I knew my chances going on the ventilator. First of all, by the time my body started rejecting water, I said, you know what? I'm probably going to die from this because you can only live three days without water. And if you think about it, if you time it from when my body started rejecting water versus when I was admitted to the emergency room, that was the third day. So if they hadn't taken me as a patient that day, I was probably going to die at home. And I knew that, which is why my wife got me to go to the hospital. Normally I'm one of those guys that's like, I'll just, I'll suffer through, I'll be fine. You know, give me some, give me some ginger ale and a blanket and I'll get through it. And, you know, you should go to the doctor. No! You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I just, I, I, can, I can tough it out. Um, but I knew there was a good chance I was going to die from that point. And then when they told me ventilator, I was like, okay, so this is, this is the end. Better say goodbye to the people I care about. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and there's a good chance I won't come back from this. And I knew it. And I was so sick that I was fine with it. Like, I wasn't like fighting it or I wasn't upset 
I was at peace with the fact that, okay, because I literally, I, I didn't have the strength. You have to remember, I couldn't, I couldn't walk to the bathroom myself. Um, I didn't have the strength. I mean, I could barely lift my arms. Um, I didn't have the strength to fight anything. I was like, okay, you know, well, this is, this is it, this is it. Um, but when I woke up uh, in the ICU and saw, like, that I was still on earth in the hospital, you know, that I, the ventilator wasn't there anymore, I was awake and things were, you know, I was like, you know what, I'm going to make it. And I started crying, and I'm not a crier. Like, there's nothing wrong with, with crying. I'm not saying that people shouldn't cry or men shouldn't cry or anything. No, I, I fully believe in everybody showing their emotions, men and women, but it's just not something I do very often. And I've probably cried a half dozen times in my life. And uh, I just started crying. I'm, I made it out. I survived. And so... Um, I'm trying to use my phone, but I, my hand-eye coordination isn't back yet, um, and, uh, you know, I can't really see, but I, I don't, can't remember if I get some help or if I finally figure out how to do it. I call my wife, I call my pastor, I call a few other close friends, and I let them know I'm alive. Um, eventually, they take the tube out, uh, and I'm incredibly thirsty. My throat's just so raw. Uh, they give me water, they give me juice. Um, you know, I start calling other people and video chatting people and, um, at some point, I can't remember if it was before or after they removed the tube, they told me to cough as much as I could. And, um, and I coughed and all this stuff came out because if you, if you know anything about COVID-19, you're one of the, the main thing that it does to you that, that takes you out is it fills your lungs with mucus. And uh, so my lungs were like completely full of mucus and that's why I couldn't breathe. And so you have to cough all that mucus out. And so I was coughing and coughing and all this stuff was coming out, but that was a good sign. It was coming out of my lungs. It wasn't part of me anymore. And uh, here, I had one of these the whole time I was in the hospital to measure my lung capacity, how much your lungs are working and how much are filled with stuff. And you're supposed to be able to get it, the blue thing to go all the way to the top, but keep this blue thing between these two marks. And when I, when I first, when my oxygen started to drop, I couldn't get it higher than here. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just show you just to see, you, you, you suck in on it. So I don't know how much you could see. I was trying to look at this and look at the camera, but I think I did a pretty good job of keeping it between the indicators. And I can go all the way to the top now because my lung function is mostly back to normal. But so anyhow, um, so I cough all the stuff out of my lungs. They take the tube out. I can't really see. Um, I still don't have the functions uh, or the strength to do normal things. I can't sit up on my own. If I want to, if I want to sit up in bed. I have to call a nurse and they have to physically sit me up. Um, right now there's still tubes in me so I don't have to go to the bathroom um, and I can't eat anything yet. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm, you know, the first step is me getting, is making sure that I can breathe on my own. And we do that. Um, and then as my breathing gets stronger and my body gets stronger eventually I can sit up on my own and uh, eventually they take the tubes out and um, and I start having to relearn how to walk like a baby and uh, because not only had my muscles atrophied from my time in the hospital but my brain and my muscles didn't remember a lot of stuff and I have to literally relearn basic things one of the worst ones was I had to relearn how to pee because there was a tube in there that did it for me for more than two weeks, I think. And so uh, the first couple times it didn't work and they had to put the catheter back in. And that was the most painful part of the whole hospital stay. I mean, that was hot fire is what it felt like. I never want to be cathed again if I can help it. Um, so, and then the other tough thing about it, besides trying to get my strength back, trying to get my breath back, and relearning normal functions like peeing, um, 
is uh, that they had been on really strong drugs. If you think about it, I told you about two of them, the fentanyl and the propofol. I don't know the other ones by name. I know those two by name because of, um, uh, because of Prince and Michael Jackson, and that's why I remembered those. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't know all the other ones, but they have me on a ton of stuff, and I'm going through withdrawal. Um, they started giving me other medication to try to take me off the withdrawal, and then I have to withdraw from that medication. And my heart rate's still jumping all over the place, in part because of the COVID, in part because of the withdrawal. Um, my blood pressure is high. At the time, they think it's because of the withdrawal. And again, I've never had high blood pressure before. Um, I'm relearning how to walk. Um, and uh, Monday, April 13th. Remember, I got admitted on the 26th, I think it was? And Monday, April 13th, uh, my doctor, and again, it's a different doctor because they're rotating through them, uh, says, uh, you're healing up pretty good. Do you think we can send you home this week? And I said, uh, well... I'm kind of scared because if I'm still going through withdrawal, I don't want to do that at home. What if something happens with my heart or what if something happens with something else and I'm going through withdrawal and I'm at home and there's no doctors and nurses there? And she said, well, if we can get your withdrawal to the point where your only symptom is discomfort, we know your heart is safe and we know this and that is fine, I'd rather you go through it at home because you're on, a, you're on the ICU, you're on a floor with all sorts of dangerous diseases. If you stay in the hospital, um, there's a good chance that you're, that you're, it's safer for you at home is basically what she said. And I said, okay, I'm, you know what? You convinced me. That's, that's a convincing argument. I will go through the withdrawal at home. And um, so they discharged me on April 15th, and uh, which was the, how many years? Um, I met my wife on April 15th, 2001. So I'm trying to think of how many years that was. That would have been 19 year anniversary of meeting my wife? Um, you guys do the math. But anyhow, it was an anniversary. Um, and so I still haven't fully le relearned how to walk. So they were gonna send me home with a walker. Um, but I said, you know what, I think I, think I could manage. And so I didn't take the walker. When I, when I got home, um, I could walk, but I couldn't do stairs, so I had to really struggle to get in the house and then up to the bedroom and stuff like that. Um, I was in a lot of pain. Um, I still am, by the way. It's been, um, over a month since I've been home now that I'm making this video. Um, but my legs in particular, because of the muscles building back and relearning how to walk, um, my back and my, like, I guess technically my butt, it's, the muscles there, not, you know, my butt itself, but, um, yeah, I, I still, when I came home, I was in a lot of pain, and I still am in some, um, I came home, I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't barely, like, I couldn't walk to the mailbox and back without, like, having to sit down or lay down, because I'd be so tired, and I can do that now, but it's still, it's still tiring, um, it's, you know, I, I, I've been home a month, like I said, or over a month, and a lot of this stuff is still coming back to me. I can walk, I can do stairs now, um, but I can't do heavy lifting. Um, I probably couldn't walk very far. Like, if I went for a walk, that would probably be a bad idea. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm still recovering. And then the other thing that, we didn't know when I left the hospital is uh, apparently uh, COVID-19 can cause blood clots. And uh, I never had high blood pressure before, but it's high now that I've been home from the hospital. And one reason they think that is, is they think there still might be some blood clots uh, caused by the COVID-19. Um, and so they've got me on a whole bunch of different medications for that and for, um, For other things, as a result, I'm still taking a lot of meds, um, and uh, the other thing is they don't know for sure whether I'm immune or whether I could get it again. When I left the hospital, they told me, "Oh, you're you're immune. You're immune. This will be great. You can, you know, once you recover, um, you won't have to worry. You can donate plasma to help other COVID patients, and so on and so forth." And now the science, 
we're learning new things and they're not sure anymore. They think there's a possibility. So I'm still, when I go out, I'm wearing a mask and I'm using the hand sanitizer and I'm, you know, doing all the precautions that I was doing uh, before I got it. Um, don't know where I got it because I was only going to church, the grocery store and the gas station and I was washing my hands and using sanitizer and staying six feet. So, you know, I originally thought I must have touched like the gas pump and there was somebody's germs on there and then I rubbed my eyes or something. Um, but now they're saying it, they don't think it spreads that way. So I don't know. I don't know where I got it. Like I said, I was only going to work and we were down to 10 people when none of them were sick and um, they could have still been a carrier, but you know, I was going to the grocery store, I was going to the gas station and that was it. Um, so here were my takeaways that I want to make sure I share with people. Um, I am a testimony and a witness that anybody can get sick and almost die from it. Uh, again, when I got it, they thought that if you were young and healthy, then you didn't have to worry. If you got it, it wouldn't be bad. And I am proof that that's not the case. And since then, there have been a lot of other cases. There have been babies that have died from it. And there have been teenagers that have died from it, all of which had no you know, pre-existing conditions and whatnot. Uh, so we definitely learned uh, that that wasn't the case, but I was one of the first. And that's why, if you've seen, there have been a lot of news stories and things done on me. Um, so uh, it was pretty common, and still is to a degree, but especially then it was pretty common that people were getting turned away from hospitals uh, like I did. And if my wife hadn't fought to get me admitted, um, I would have died. And so if you're sick enough that you need to be in the hospital, you need to fight. Um, but of course, there's reasons why in some cases, it's better not to be in the hospital. If you're, if you're not sick enough that you need the hospital, A, they need that bed for somebody else, and B, just like the way they sent me home, it's safer to be at home than to be around diseased people. So if you're not uh, sick enough that you need the hospital, you're better to stay home. So how do you know if you're sick enough uh, to need to be hospitalized? Um, well, I asked my doctors. Um, so that I could share it with you and share it with the people on the news and everything else like that. And uh, the general consensus is uh, if you have trouble breathing, you need to be in the hospital. If you start rejecting food and water the way I did, you need to be in the hospital. And you can get a home oximeter, which measure, measures your oxygen levels. Remember I talked about how 100 is perfect, 90 to 100 is okay, below 90 means you need to be in the hospital. And you can get one at on Amazon for like 30 bucks. I haven't checked, but I'm assuming Walgreens and Walmart and those type of places have them too. Um, but you can get, uh, you can get an oximeter for, you know, 30 bucks and you can measure your oxygen levels at home. And, uh, if they drop below 90, you need to be in the hospital. Um, so, uh, then the other thing was that they wouldn't discharge me until I was free from COVID-19 and you have to test symptom-free for 72 hours, and it'd be at least seven days since you originally presented symptoms. Um, so if you had it, and you want to know when am I clear, uh, 72 hours of no symptoms and seven days from when the symptoms first started is the best uh, measure that we have. Um, and I want to make sure that everybody takes this seriously. Um, don't go into public, into areas where there's going to be a lot of people without wearing a mask. Uh, wash your hands as much as you can. Bring hand sanitizer with it, with you. Use it anytime you touch something that's not yours. Um, you know, I bring it with in the stores and sanitize my hands after the self-checkouts and whatever. Um, you know, don't go out if you don't need to. Don't go into anywhere where there's groups of people. When you are with other people, stay six feet away, you know. Um, all it takes is one person who's carrying the disease, whether they're symptomatic or not, to spray spit in your direction and you take it in and um, and you could get as sick as me. Um, so I, as long as you don't have to go out in it to work, I don't think the staying at home is bad. You miss your friends, you miss your family, that's what video chatting is for. It's been, you know, it's not the same thing, but it's been great. I've really grown to appreciate it. Um, you know, and a lot of, that's why we have a lot of our favorite musicians are doing uh, social media concerts and Instagram battles and things like that. It's been wonderful. I mean, 
Um, a lot of some of us have to go out and it's a work, you know, sometimes myself included, and that's understandable. Just stay as safe as you can while you're working. You know, wear a mask if you're going to be in groups of people. Six feet, wash your hands, etc. That's the best that we can do right now until uh, they develop a vaccine. Because otherwise, anybody can transfer it, anybody can get it, and anybody can die. And, um, you know, there, I wish there was a, a better solution. Um, now a lot of the states are lifting their stay-at-home, safer-at-home orders. It's not because the virus is gone. It's not because it's safe to be outside. It's because we've gotten through the worst of it, so now we don't have to worry as much about overcrowded hospitals. It means the hospitals have enough beds if you get sick. But you can still get sick and you can still die. So please be careful. Um, you know, I wouldn't wish what I went through on anyone. Um, you know, it's just, I mean, not being able to breathe, feel, feeling like you're going to die, having to be on a machine, um, having hot fire shooting into your man parts because you need a catheter. I ended up having to be cast, I think, three or four times, which was the worst part of the entire thing. Um... Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish any of it on anyone, and all you have to do is be careful, and you can reduce your chances of getting it significantly. So please be careful. Um, but anyhow, that's why you haven't seen as many videos from me. Um, prior to getting COVID-19, I, you know, had the sinus infection. I wasn't doing as much, and then um, I was in the hospital for a month. And now I've been home recovering, and I can't do a whole lot. I can't do any heavy lifting, so moving fans around is hard. Um, for the people that follow me for fans, um, hopefully Metal Pete and I will get together soon, and you can see some fan-related content. Uh, he can do the heavy lifting, and we can still do some fun videos. The people that follow me for music content, I've, you know, I've been back at church since May 1st, I think. Beginning of May was my, my first uh, Sunday back at work. And so you've still been getting organ content. I'll have some guitar content up soon, hopefully. Um, so, um, you know, I'll be posting more and more. Um, but uh, this is why, and this is important, and I hope that everybody stays safe. Um, if you like my shirt, this is from Shop Tiffography. So make sure to check that out. Uh, but don't buy anything from there if you haven't already bought them from Shop D Spiffy. So, um, any questions, put them in the comments. Thanks for watching.